So um, thank you all for attending this session. Um, we're going to spend the next um, hour talking about um, AI in the context of conflict, war, and peace. Um, and um, I've got four distinguished um, international um, um, panel members with me. So what I thought I'd start by doing is to give them five minutes to introduce themselves, five minutes each, to introduce themselves um, and say something interesting or controversial maybe about the topic um, before going into some questions that I've pre-prepared um, and then finally open it up to the audience to ask um, questions and provoke some uh, conflict amongst our panel members if we can. So let me start by inviting um, Nick, if I may, to introduce himself. So do you want to... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Right, great, wonderful. Okay, so I'm Nick Colosimo. I work for BAE Systems as principal technologist and also as technology strategy manager. I'm also a visiting professor at Cranfield University where I'm assigned to the Autonomous and Cyber Physical Systems Center. So I guess I'm really a, a futurist, uh, but unlike most futurists, occasionally I get asked to prove it and prove it through state-of-the-art demonstrations. This has included the development and demonstration of a surrogate UAV, autonomous elements of a male UAV mission system, UAV airspace integration such as sense and avoid capability, and mixed reality cockpits and command centers designed to manage multiple semi-autonomous vehicles. I'm really fortunate to have uh, four quite brilliant friends on this topic. Uh, Wing Commander Keith Deere in Joint Forces Command, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Al Brown, the author of the MOD Human Machine Teaming Joint Concept Note, and Dr. Heather Roth, a leading AI ethicist and formerly of DeepMind. And uh, last but not least, uh, Antonios, uh, Professor Antonio Sordos, who's a leading aerospace and defense autonomous systems expert at Cranfield University. And each of these has really influenced my perspectives over the years. So here are three areas of interest and concern. The ease of weaponization of commercial off-the-shelf AI and autonomous systems technologies, drones with IEDs and offensive cyber algorithms are just a couple of examples. This is a particular concern with rogue threat actors that don't share the same values and conservatism as we do nor do they follow the rules, so bans would be ineffective. Ease of weaponization, because they can be readily repurposed, are available, affordable, and untraceable, whilst being increasingly capable. Just consider that the US DOD accounted for 36% of all global R&D spend in 1960, when now it's circa 1%. Commercial technology dominates. So do we need a weaponization index and measures taken to reduce the risk from commercial technology? My next interest is with the very small. Not large weapons or UAVs carrying weapon systems, but vehicles the size of your own hand down to your fingernail. Systems that are difficult to detect and counter, systems capable of having significant combat mass, sheer overwhelming numbers, equipped with neuromorphic processing. A brain on a chip or even a gel are already emerging. Promising ever higher neuromorphic performance per unit size, weight, and power, making such systems pretty smart and pretty compact. Last in my top three are adversarial networks, systems capable of breaking deep learning neural networks. You may have seen pictures of school buses misclassified as an ostrich through the addition of subtle noise that you and I would find very, very difficult to spot. We rely on such systems at some risk because we need to explain them. We don't yet trust them. It is no longer a tank and is now an ambulance or vice versa because the adversary has included a particular pattern of camouflage generated by an adversarial network. Worryingly, humans may not be exempt from such exploitation. Recent work in a Harvard lab on monkeys has demonstrated the potential to change mental state and more. This is perhaps a more profound form of stimulation than, say, looking at an image of a beautiful tropical beach. 
These are just some threats we need to understand, but in some cases there may be opportunities to leverage the technology to increase the capabilities of our forces, but we must do so carefully and avoid the many slippery slopes on the topic. For me, this initially comes down to two things. First, what is the compelling need for speed, in which there is little scope for a human in the loop or even on the loop, and need to progress through the OODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, and act loop faster than any human can, given the emergence of machine speed warfare. Digitized battlefields, cyber, electromagnetics, directed energy weapons, automated command and control, and so on. When does speed necessitate a machine-driven solution? Secondly, what is the risk, considering the impact of not acting, and when we do act, the potential impact of that action on non-combatants and blue forces when things might go wrong? There is a framework here I've been developing that attempts to show when automation is reckless, when there is no choice, when there are other options, and when the risks associated with things going wrong are very low. We can overlay different autonomous solutions atop of this framework to see where the issues are. This applies to security as well as defense, but it requires the incorporation of several other dimensions, many of which we'll touch on in the discussions today, no doubt. And I think then we can get on to questions of trust, predictability, reliability, and explainability in the applications of AI in this particular field. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nick. Um, and next we'll go across to Australia and our Australian colleague. And it's my pleasure to welcome Alan. Uh, Adam, sorry, not Alan. <laughs> All the way from Australia. Hello. Can you hear me OK? Um, my name's Adam Solwick. I work for the Australian um, government for DST, Defence Science and Technology Organisation. My background is in linguistics, so I bring a uh, linguistic focus to the work. And uh, the work of the team that I work with is in high-level information fusion. Uh, we work uh, bringing heterogeneous data sources together to provide real-time uh, situation analysis and prediction of events, activity-based analysis, and so on. So I'd like to pick up on some of the issues that uh, have been nicely drawn out here. So some of the um, key points that we're looking at are the reliability of information, the four Vs, so volume, variety, veracity, and velocity. We have, uh, as we all know, we have a, a data deluge to deal with. And a lot of the information comes to us in different levels uh, of information. So. Uh, unstructured information sources, partially structured and highly structured. There are hard data sources and soft data sources. Uh, these all represent particular challenges of their own and require different techniques. Uh, in order to bring the information together to provide it to analysts in real time, we need to have techniques that will allow the analyst to have confidence in the information. How much can the analysts trust the information and how much in, uh, can they engage with the information in a natural way? So this draws out some things like uh, human-computer inter interaction techniques as well as uh, validation of the information. We're also investigating techniques to handle degrees of certainty and uncertainty, uh, which requires us to uh, investigate different ways that you can look at the uncertainty of the heterogeneous information within a uh, uh, combined uh, data space. So as you can see, there's, there are a plethora of different problems that we're addressing and uh, we don't claim to have all the answers. And that's why we look out to state of the art, to the research community, to the academic community uh, to bring these in. Another aspect for us which is very important is uh, automated systems and the level of trust that we can expect to have. And I guess you asked us to bring out a particular, perhaps, um, a topic of uh, relevance or importance. One, I've heard some nice talks this morning about ethics 
Uh, as you can imagine, in the, the field that I work in, we are very, very concerned as the Australian government, concerned about data ethics and using data in an ethical way. And uh, I've observed that a lot of the Western liberal democracies are very concerned that we use data in an ethical way. But is it the case that our adversaries are also so concerned with using data in an ethical way? And I challenge you to think about that. And how do we engage with that problem as people who are very concerned that the data is used ethically uh, and uh, with adversaries who may not be so concerned? So that, that's a very big challenge for us as well. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and uh, pass over to the next. Thank you. So um, I'll now bring in one of our PhD students, uh, Gillam, who will introduce himself. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Guillem. So uh, I'm finishing my PhD at Warwick University. Um, I'm currently on a research placement at the Alan Turing Institute, working on conflict modeling. So myself, I'm a physicist. So my, my background is mostly on statistical mechanics. And particularly, I focus on the study of complex networks. So in network, in network analysis, we use graph theory to apply methods of physics in a variety of real-world scenarios. So for instance, I've been working on, on opinion dynamics, where the focus is on studying the formation of consensus and the diffusion of opinions in a network of social context. I've also worked on transport networks where, well, you basically study the topology of some sort of uh, distribution systems that can be uh, rail networks or road networks or energy distributing systems. And you try to find similarities in the topology of these systems that explain the robustness and the vulnerabil vulnerabilities. And yeah, another area of application of my work is biological sciences. So basically, I, I work on, well, with genetic data to study gene regulatory networks or protein protein interaction ne networks, uh, all the way to the level of uh, new neural networks in the biological sense. And as well, here you're trying to find similarities in the topologies of these biological systems and actually compare them to social or transport systems. And with all of this, I find, I have found like an application in the field of conflict modeling that I cannot really explain myself at least right now, how did I get there? But the, the reality is that conflict modeling is a very rich academic field, which in my experience, it's been very, very interesting to work on. And it has a, a very nice niche on, on the work of complex analysis that I've been doing with the rest of the system. So the idea, the idea of my work at the Turing Institute is try to apply network science for the modeling and prediction of conflict in, in real world scenarios. So in this sort of fields, you have uh, two, different, two different approaches. One would be the modeling point of view, so finding theoretical arguments on why war or cooperation develops between countries or between actors in general in the international uh, system. And the other would be on prediction and forecasting. So using machine learning and AI and in general data-driven models to inform policy and to predict where the next big conflict is going to be. And there are many different efforts that have been done in this, in this direction, which I think we will have time to discuss. What is the role of AI in this sort of uh, analysis and what are the challenges that AI may pose to policymakers and academics? And yeah, with that, I'll move to the next speaker. Thank you.
Thank you, and last but not least, uh, Anthony from one of our partner organizations, DSTL. Uh, hello, um, yeah, my name is Anthony Butts. Um, I'm from the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory, uh, which is um, part of the MOD. Um, uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, so I've only been with the MOD for two months, so um, I wasn't expecting it. Um, so uh, we use AI in um, a, a lot, well, starting to use it in a lot of different things. Um, so an obvious application is for the defense of platforms. Um, there's a missile coming towards a ship. How best to, um, to defeat it? Um, in, in my specific role as, uh, in wargaming, um, which I sh should just back up and explain what wargaming is. Um, basically, it's trying to predict the future by having people play a game, which is um, you know, s s some model of how we think the world works. Um, and that way we can test courses of action um, and to uh, you know, t test it in the most uh, ruthless way possible, where you have a, a thinking adversary trying to outwit what you've just done. Um, so uh, there's lots of, uh, lots of things we can do with that. So for instance, uh, uh, we can learn how to use AI to play war games, which sounds simple because we've all heard of AlphaGo, but even the most simple game like Ogre, it's fiendishly difficult to get an AI to actually play. Um, and that's something we're actively uh, developing at the moment. Um, also, uh, how do you log a war game? Remember, these are kind of very complex uh, discussions going on. A lot of issues are being raised. There's negotiation going on between partners. Um, how do we log it? I mean, uh, looking at uh, people's faces, seeing how that's changing, how the pattern of the negotiation is changing uh, um, so in, in terms of people uh, accepting or disregarding somebody's uh, offer. Um, and also, the thing that really impassions me is to try to uh, make it less kinetic, to bring in more of the kind of uh, political and social science out there. Um, and I should back up and explain sort of my, my past now. So um, I originally was in physics and then investment banking. And then for 12 years, I made documentaries. I was directing them uh, for TV out in uh, former Soviet Union and so on. And I, I really became concerned that uh, there are a lot of mistakes people were making uh, on the ground, and I felt that there really needed to be more sophisticated uh, um, uh, thinking going on. Um, so that, that's inspired me to sort of retrain in political science, and uh, um, I made a company called Peace Engine, that the idea was, can you model a, a complex social system, uh, a society, and you know, figure out how we can steer it towards peace. Can we, one, can we run thousands of different courses of action and figure out what, what is the best way to, uh, to act? Can we sort of predict the unpredictable <laughs> and so on? Um, which, which leads me to applying this now um, in the Ministry of Defense. I think there's, you know, I want to encourage you to think about a future where we can solve global crises uh, through understanding how societies tick, understanding the, the motivations of, of people rather than just calling them terrorists. Let's go into the grievances. Let's try to think intelligently about how to unpick complex conflicts. Um, and, there's, uh, and we can use war games for this. We can use machine learning to understand how societies work. We can uh, uh, take the discourse of what's going on in the radios and turn that into concept maps of people's psychology and try to you know, build up a much more sophisticated picture. Um, and I believe that you know, this can help create a, a safer world. Migration, wh why deploy a ship there if you can stop it at the root cause? If we can go to the Sahel and, uh, and, and figure out you know, how, how to increase stability uh, between uh, uh, you know, rival tribes. And that, that way you can get, you can, we can do an awful lot of good. Um, especially considering the UK has a, a lot of power here. We've got 0.7% of our gross national income goes into soft power, into influence. Let's, let's make that work far more effectively. And I think that uh, machine learning, AI, and all this stuff c can help with that. So yeah, for, for me, it's a very, uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there um, to sort of push on 
good old British values of you know, uh, human rights and a, a tolerant and unpolarized world. So, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> So Anthony just posed about um, five of my opening questions, uh, which is quite good, thank you. Um, so um, what I'll do is I will continue going through my questions, but I'll perhaps pose them to the other panel members to start with. Uh, so my first question was going to be, how can AI help, understanding, help, help with the understanding of complex current um, operating environments? Uh, so Adam, you're nodding. Would you like to start? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to answer that by posing another question, <laughs> which is, what is AI? And I think that um, AI is very often used as a very broad cover term for a plethora of different technologies and capabilities. So the answer, I think, to your question comes down to the particular type of technology that may be best suited for a particular problem. Okay, so um, given that we're at COGX, and AI to me appears to be a kind of catch-all phrase for anything where one can derive value from um, the exploitation of data, um, then I will couch my question as, um, well, I'll, I'll append AI to AI data science, statistics, computer science, data-driven technologies. How can they help with the understanding of complex operating and complex kind of um, environments of that kind? So I will broaden your question again, rather than make it a specific technology question. <clears throat> so I think uh, one of the answers to that is from a data-driven approach, you can use the techniques to identify behaviors that exist hidden in the data. So in other words, latent behaviors that you may not be aware of, but using well-structured data processing techniques, you can reveal the hidden needles in the haystack, if you like. Um, can, can, sorry to interrupt you, can you give us an example? Yeah, sure. So we're doing some work on um, detecting illegal fishing. Now, about a third of the world's fishing stocks are taken by illegal, through illegal means. And this is a, uh, this is a potential um, impact on our world resources and it's unsustainable. Now, if you can use um, self-reported data, so AIS data about the beha behavior of ships, um, you can detect, for example, the potential for uh, vessels in uh, marine zones uh, or where vessels turn off their AIS uh, self-reporting um, and potentially identify cases where fishers are going into marine zones and fishing and then um, doing a transshipment. So uh, this can be done using uh, machine learning techniques over, over large data sources. Thank you. Kill him. <clears throat> so I think AI in this field of complex modeling, at least from my perspective, which is sort of a global or microscopic perspective of the phenomenon itself, it can help in, in mainly three different ways. The first one and most obvious is uh, data collection. So as you may imagine, collecting data uh, about war and in general conflict between states or domestic conflict or whatever is quite hard and it's surrounded with, surrounded with lots of difficulties. And nowadays it's main, AI is mainly used in, in the form of probably NLP, so automated processes, pro pro processes that check news from everywhere in the world and try to get signals of events, interesting events going on that may have something to do with conflict, right? This, another, another area is uh, image processing. So people use uh, images from satellites, for instance, to try to recover, I don't know, from socioeconomic to conflict or destruction data or stuff like that. Uh, the second point where AI helps is in, in the modeling itself. So people concerned with theoretical considerations on how conflict emerges in, in a human society are using widely machine learning methods to, because, well, this, the sort of models that you use in these theoretical discussions tend to be quite complex. 
So in terms of optimizing them and finding parameter ranges and stuff like that, machine learning methods have been crucial in, in the advancement of uh, conflict models. And the third one is the more crude and probably the more applied one, which is uh, forecasting itself. So people is building from decades ago these so-called uh, early warning systems. So these are integrated systems where uh, people use data-driven models to get information on which are the hotspots of the world or in a given region or in a given period of time or wherever. And the idea uh, is that these, these systems use uh, very complex hierarchical models. So you need some sort of a complex machine learning uh, methodology to actually make sense out of them. But the nice thing is that in contrast with uh, the modeling perspective where you want a proper understanding of the phenomena, in forecasting, sometimes you only need a risk prediction, so you are less interested in knowing the exact mechanism that is driven this forecasted uh, crisis, and you just want a good predictor. But in any case, uh, there's an interaction between these three topics I've mentioned. I think there's a lot of interactions, actually. And all of them are crucial if we want to make conflict prediction and conflict modeling a part of the decision making that uh, policymakers uh, take into account when making decisions on anything regarding conflict that can be imposing sanctions or declaring wars, obviously, or um, trying to come out with combined strategies in the international communities on where should be intervene. And well, there's a lot of uh, ethics and lots of considerations that probably we can get uh, more deeply into later on. Thank you. Just, uh, just really quickly, just to, um, I think, some observations uh, from the discussion so, so far. So I think one of the things that AI does with respect to conflict is that it focuses the mind on the laws of armed conflict, on ethics, on rules of engagement, and that's, that's a good thing uh, to be thinking about those subjects more. I think we've already mentioned its use as a prediction tool, the ability to predict what will happen if we try out different things, and those different things could be you know, soft power that Anthony mentioned earlier, to say that actually what we're trying to achieve in a conflict is persuasion or dissuasion of an adversary's course of action. And there are many means at, dis at the disposal for that. And if we can play out some of those effects to say that some soft power type, um, type influence might bring about uh, dissuading the adversary, then that's a good thing. So you might think of it as a soft power amplifier. And then lastly, I think as a behavioral uh, assessment tool, which I think we, we've just been discussing, where perhaps you know, the scenario is underway and we're trying to correlate different behaviors, different agents in the network to understand who's doing what to whom and where the priorities are in that particular space. Thank you. So um, that topic is not often spoken about in the popular press. We don't often hear about the uses of data science, artificial intelligence for the understanding of complex environments and therefore leading to better decision making, not least, I guess, because it's not a particularly interesting topic to the general public at large. Um, but what's often spoken about um, are the potential misuses of this technology. So, and, and Nick's kind of switched the focus slightly though. So um, I'm particularly keen to hear from you um, about really how worried should we be about the misuse of AI um, and interpret that in the most general sense in war and conflict. And the second follow-up question is, what should we as an academic community and then as a society do to, um, to, to prevent and regulate this? So. Uh, so I think the first thing to say is that no war fighter wants a weapon that they don't trust, that is unpredictable, that can perhaps cause um, excessive collateral damage, that can perhaps cause fratricide, that is simply not a reliable weapon. I don't think uh, any warfighter ever wants that. 
Uh, so that's the first thing uh, I think to, to say. Then I should also emphasize as well that the defense industry and certainly, certainly the UK and our allies are in a position where we are quite conservative in terms of, in terms of warfare. We do follow the rules, um, but the risk is that the adversary doesn't follow the rules. So if we went down the road of attempting to, to ban autonomous weapons, the risk is that the adversary will pay attention to that and behind the scenes will effectively ignore it while saying in social media or the press or elsewhere that they are complying. The difficulty is the verification that they are complying because at the end of the day, we're talking about software. So I think there's got to be another route through this um, so I'm, I'm not against regulation. I think regulation will be required, but it has to be appropriate to bring about the results that we want, and that is to avoid the slippery slopes associated with this particular topic. Yes, uh, I'd like to add to that that just as we uh, do, we couch humans, all of us, in regulatory and social frameworks and conventions within which we operate. There are legal frameworks, social frameworks, practical frameworks such as driving on the left, stopping at traffic lights and so on. So I think we need to couch AI systems in similar social, ethical and legal frameworks that we as an international community agree to. Now, not all humans um, comply with those uh, frameworks and then we have to develop mechanisms by which we uh, tell those humans whoops you've gone outside that. that that's beyond our conventional norm so you have to come back inside similarly I think that that's the sort of approach that we need to adopt as an international community how we how we police that is another issue, but there does need to be a, an internationally recognized framework around, in my opinion, around how these systems operate. Because just as, as you said, Nick, um, it's a fallacy to think that uh, these technologies will not be used um, in conflict situations. Yeah, um, nothing much to add, really. Um, mostly echoing Nick's comment. Um, there's a, it, it's a UK government policy that we don't ever envisage uh, autonomous weapons delivering lethal force without there being a human in the loop. So um, uh, deadly swarming killer robots, no. And I've not met anybody uh, inside who actually wants that. We all uh, don't want it at all. So I think from the broad perspective of conflict prediction, the uses of AI has uh, have certain problems that the community is aware of. For instance, uh, imagine we reach a point where with AI or machine learning or statistical methods or whatever, we have a very robust knowledge of where the next conflict is going to be and so on and so forth. Now, there's a clear risk of uh, self-fulfilling prophecies here, like I am a state and I see that there's a high risk of conflict here, so I move towards a quick intervention and whilst doing that um, I'm probably augmenting the probabilities of actually creating a conflict in, in that area and fulfilling the prediction, whereas the the outcome is not what I what I expected at the beginning. So pr there's a there's a problem here. There's a more general problem in in the sense of having these sort of early warning systems where governments can be equipped with with this knowledge of what will happen if I intervene here or there, and we basically have some players that can misuse this. And I think the from the community the. The way to address this is as with everything in AI, which I think is transparency and poor public availability. So I would say that these early warning systems I talked before, there's a few which are private and are not accept accessible publicly, but there are some which are starting to move towards 
uh, transparent models, and I think that is that is a way to go. And well, there's a, a very different problem here as well with the use of AI, and it has to do with the general rebranding that AI has had as a kind of p AI offers you a vision from nowhere, like a very skeptic uh, view where people are giving you predictions that don't have an ideology behind and stuff like that. Well, I think this is not the case. I think every machine learning system needs to be trained. And the way you train a system actually influences the decisions it will make. So we need to be quite aware of that when we are training either a model for conflict prediction or a, a bot, a drone that is moving in the combat space, uh, recognizing some signatures in order to do an attack. Well, probably the way you train that drone well, or the intelligence of that drone is going to be extremely important. And again, you need to be transparent and, I think, uh, open with that if you want to reach a, a point where you don't have these sort of very problematic situations. Thank you. So, um, so really, we touched upon two potential um, risks or worries that we should have. Uh, one is in the obvious one where everybody jumps to, which is autonomous weapons. And then secondly, um, we kind of covered then uh, some potential risks associated with conflict prediction. I think it was Anthony, you that mentioned um, influence operations and the use of or, yeah, the use of artificial intelligence in those kinds of operations. Is there anything you can offer us um, from that perspective where you see that there might be a risk of using AI in the context of um, trying to influence uh, well, one person up th all the way through to a whole nation state? <clears throat> sure. Um, there's the obvious one that we all know about. Um, our filter bubbles being targeted uh, with stuff that can, um, um, you know, knows just exactly what buttons to push uh, in our minds, and it will send us uh, into a polarized, divided society. Um, so clearly, we need to come up with some kind of antidote for this. Um, this could be we get our news in different ways, and um, you know, and we help with that. I don't know. Um, but there's also, like, we need to understand how this process works sociologically. Um, and maybe that's more for civil society needs to, you know, do that. Uh, it's up to, I think, civil society to figure out ways to uh, not be polarized. Um, I can tell you that, uh, well, I was directing a documentary about Pussy Riot for the BBC in Moscow. Um, and you know, we, we were getting involved in an information war, um, unwittingly. Um, so I don't know how many of you remember, but in 2011, um, this was the high watermark of the anti-Putin protests. Um, and uh, also when uh, Pussy Riot were, basically had this show trial, the Russian government was making an enormous you know, meal out of it. Um, and they were really uh, you know, helping the journalists out, you know. Uh, they could have, you know, kept it, you know, quite close, but um, they ended up putting, th they ended up televising the trial with three different cameras and then releasing the footage out. So we made a, a documentary about it. Um, uh, why would they do this? Uh, it's very nice of them. Um, actually, simultaneously, they were showing to the Russian people, hey, there's, uh, there's Pussy Riot, who are like, you know, really liberal and they don't share traditional Russian values. And by the way, they're the opposition. And like half the opposition were like going, well, I don't like Putin, but you know, I'm not in with this, uh, uh, with their values. And they just split the opposition straight down the middle, right? And it took, it, it, it's, you know, we talk about voter suppression, okay? Well, that, that, that is it in action. And the journalists were part of this media frenzy. And of course, you know, um, they were, they were using, uh, they were taking pictures of us and saying, oh, by the way, the West supports Pussy Riot, uh, which means they're against you. So there was a lot of this kind of like enemy of my enemy kind of logic going on there. This is an example of uh, um, someone really understanding a society and, um, you know, using that knowledge to, uh, to, to use wedge politics. 
And I think we use this for good, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, wedge, wedge in that curve. <laughs> I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so, if we, can un if we can understand how this works, we can use the same dynamics against militia groups. We, we, can, you, we can start to understand so uh, society in order to do the same kind of thing to Al-Qaeda. You know, there's a lot of potential in, in, in applying this understanding uh, for good. You know, sort of like there's a dark side of the force and there's a good side of the force as well, you know, uh, kind of thing. Thank you. So in the opening um, 40 minutes or so, um, We've kind of covered the potential positive uses of AI with respect to understanding conflict um, and war, and um, the things that we should perhaps be worrying about as individuals in a society. Uh, so at this point, I thought it would be appropriate um, to pause my questions um, and just to see whether there are any questions from the audience. And there was one immediate hand raised, so somebody's got a very um, interesting question to raise, and we'll just wait for a microphone to appear. And I'll, just while we wait for the microphone, I will, um, I will go in the order in which I saw the question. So if I just go to the gentleman behind you first, and then you next, then we'll come over here. It's on? Great. Um, Sorry, could you just introduce yourself, yes, if you don't mind, please? Hi, my name is Marcus Salian State. Um, question for the panel, how do you collect uh, the data for managing conflict, when a lot of the data is actually hidden, if you're trying to understand militias and how they interact with each other and what they're actually doing, it doesn't come out in the news, it certainly doesn't come out very often, and you probably need quite a lot of data to be able to model it, and it tends to be very specific to the situation, so how do you actually model that? And I suppose this also covers the grievance side, which is psycho, psychological, I suppose, as well as sociological modeling. Yeah, so I think since the early 60s or so, there has been a huge effort in the social sciences community for data gathering. And I guess it, you can find uh, a wide variety of different data qualities, so to say, and from most of them are basically on fatalities, so the number of casualties that you have in, in a given geographic or temporal time set. But uh, there's also data on uh, threats between countries or diplomatic crises or stuff like that. I mean, obviously, the, if you, that, the, the data that you need will depend on the model that you are working with. So if you want to know things on the global patterns of conflict in the world, you will, you will probably be OK with uh, you know, casualty data or things like that. If you want to study a, a particular case of a terrorist network or something like that, well, probably you, you will need very refined data. And that's where uh, defense agencies can can help and sometimes there's collaborations between private or governmental uh, or, uh, research institutes for making these data sets available. So you, you would be surprised at the level of data that you can actually find. For instance, I work on, on gang wars in, in Colombia with, in collaboration with some people there. And yeah, they have efforts from the government, in, you know, doing interviews with the victims and trying to get very, very specific data sets. And they, it obviously it takes uh, years to gather this sort of data. And once you have it, well, you have a gold mine for, for modeling. So yeah, data collection is a super important aspect of this story. And methods in AI for actually sampling and finding where you are may maybe oversampling or undersampled. So having methods for detecting biases in your data 
it's very important in an automated way, I mean, by how can I detect in this data set if this region of the world is clearly undersampled and there's probably some problem with uh, someone hiding data or whatever, and then I can go and work with someone locally to get more data there or something. Thank you. Um, in the interest of getting through the questions, what I'll do is I will um, just allow one panel member to, to answer each question, unless anybody's got anything specific to say, so I'll just uh, go to you next. Okay, fine. If you want to hand it across, so um, we'll go to the lady just there in the grey. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Julia. I'm a PhD student in cybersecurity at the University of Oxford. Um, and one thing I noticed came up several times in the panel is this fear that our adversaries won't reciprocate any kind of ethics we implement. And it comes up, I think, almost even before the ethics are discussed a lot. So I was wondering whether any of you have ideas for mechanisms to build reciprocity into norms around AI conflict, so kind of incentives to have different international actors reciprocate norms. Would any, who would like to take that question? It's, uh, it's a really good question because I guess um, cyberspace is an area where the speed of response required in terms of defense and offense exceeds that which any human could achieve, right? So that it kind of necess necessitates a, a machine response. I think about, the, the thing about uh, cyber for me really is that um, the consequences of all-out cyber warfare are just so unthinkable these days in terms of the economic collapse that would occur on both sides and the disruption to the people that vote in the government is just something which I think governments would avoid, you know, so major powers, state to state. I, I think it's almost in the same category as nuclear weapons, right? I.e., there's a type of power balance which is struck. And the thing about cyber uh, for, for me is that can offer the ability to de-escalate perhaps a conventional conflict by being used as a leverage in terms of, um, in terms of what, what could happen. So we'll wind back the dial if you wind back the dial, you know, and, um, and so, so there, are, there are some concerns there. I think I'm asking a, a similar question to what's just been posed. It's about, um, we've mentioned ethics, it's about algorithm and accountability. So it's probably true to say that we have the potential here to create systems that are technologically impressive, but sociologically quite harmful, have the potential to cause great harm. Uh, and that's certainly within the realm of algorithm accountability. So my question is, um, particularly useful given the government and industry on the panel, is how do we incentivize government to spend the money to test and create more accountability? Um, and how do we incentivize business to create um, systems that are more accountable and more truthful in what they're saying? Great question, thank you. Uh, well, I can only speak from an uh, Australian perspective here. Um, certainly, we talk about a, quite a distinct divi divide between government and industry. Where I sit, uh, we think of industry as partners, close collaborators and partners, and I think a lot of our industry think the same about us. Uh, I think the incentive really here is uh, a good collaboration and a collaboration which is beneficial for all parties. And the key really is that the ethics can be built into the, uh, the AI system. So as you mentioned, Nick, the timescales are so critical that um, we, don't, we don't have the luxury to pass the ethical problem out to a human. We need to build the human's ethics into the AI so that those ethics are in there. And then we will have confidence that as humans, that an AI system can explain its ethics that it's using in its calculations to humans. And if we are prepared to trust those ethics, then we can say to the AI system, 
as long as you adhere to those ethics that we agree with, that are internationally recognized and adopted, you can make those decisions in time critical uh, points. I mean, I, I'm uh, basically simulating societies and what if scenarios um, in order to get better decision support. Um, so anything that improves the model above uh, what the alternatives are is, is good, I would argue. Um, there's always going to be a rush on these things, always a need to get better data, and we shouldn't be sort of making the models so we understand this particular thing really, really well, and that thing, oh, we're just going to have a counter. You know, that, that wouldn't get a good result, right? So there has to be ethics in, uh, in model design. Um, wouldn't you agree? Question in the front. Thank you. Alex Dyer from UCL. You've mentioned that the, um, in the case of state-to-state -state interactions, you can have a sort of mutually assured destruction in terms of cybersecurity. When it comes down to individual malicious actors, in the past, if it was nuclear, you would have physical detectors for that sort of thing. Um, in terms of chemical stuff, there's a kind of whole mechanism for tracking that sort of material. Is there even in principle a way of tracking kind of online behavior for malicious software at the individual level? Is that, from a network approach, even possible? I think it's a pretty scary possibility. Um, and uh, where I think you've got two adversaries who have a lot to lose, then you can perhaps strike a, a balance and a pseudo piece. Whereas, you know, and as I said in the, the opening talk, there's a number of commercial off-the-shelf technologies which could be weaponized and advanced cyber algorithms used in an offensive sense by lone threat actors, uh, perhaps rogue states with not a lot to lose, then, you know, these things are, in my opinion, very real future risks, and uh, we need to do everything we can to prevent that, but it's, you know, it's the, the same argument that I made before, it is very, very difficult to verify and, uh, and validate and understand who exactly has got what, particularly when much of this code is available freely for many, many legitimate uses, uh, good uses that move the economies forward, make people's lives better and so on. There's always that risk of misuse. So what can we do, what can industry do, um, who are putting things out there, making things open source, to ensure that it's very difficult to weaponize those pieces of code? I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think there is an answer required in there somewhere. Hi, Martin Simpson. I just have a question in that sort of um, no man's land between virtual space and moving towards a kinetic solution to, to a threat. And I'm thinking specifically in the context of social division, where you might have a state actor who's deliberately stirring the pot over a sustained period of time. Where do you see ethics and moving into rules of war, rules of engagement, such that you can move from a virtual threat that's causing disruption and civil unrest in Western society potentially, and then seeing a justification for a kinetic solution to mitigating that threat. Sorry, Anthony, I think that's probably kind of looking at you when I said that, you or Nick, really. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's very hard to, you know, if somebody's doing an influence off on you, what you can do is shoot them. Um, I think that we need to be thinking in terms of either a balance of power of influence. So you mess with me, Al, I'm messing with you. And it's like a bit like with cyber, we both demonstrated we have the ability and we both sort of step back because we'll split each other's countries apart otherwise. Um, or um, we try to figure out how to neutralize, uh, you know, uh, um, somebody else's influence operation. For example, um, in East Ukraine, I'll take my DSTL hat off for a second, I felt very strongly that if the Ukrainian government had just said, hey guys, we recognize your grievances, they're legitimate, we're sorry by the way, 
you're not terrorists, you know, we love you, this kind of thing. I think that well, my sense was that a lot of the rebels would be kind of like, you know what, thanks, you know. Um, you know, the reason I'm standing here is because no one's listening to me, uh, my life sucks, etc. Um, you know, I'll put, it, put the hat back on now. I, I think we need to think in terms of, you know, th th this kind of thing, about getting, reaching the high ground first, about how to defeat somebody else's influence campaign by, you know, seeing what they're up to and, you know, try to take that ground from underneath them. So, uh, in other words, you know, can we make an immune system, you know, to combat uh, an influence attack rather than just sort of like, you know, let it ravage our society, you know? That, that to me is really interesting and where I think it's almost totally new territory. Uh, if somebody here knows how to do that, please get in touch. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thanks, yeah, it's interesting, cheers. Any final questions? I think we've got time for one final question. No, okay, well, I'll ask my final question then. So, um, if each of you had um, a million pounds to spend on research in this area, and you had a sentence to describe that research, um, then what would you spend that million pounds on? So um, I think I would spend it on uh, two things. Uh, one is neuromorphic processing, uh, so novel forms of neuromorphic processing uh, to, uh, to perhaps provide a more explainable AI solution. And so I'm fascinated by Dr. Simon Stringer's work on spiking neural networks, uh, which um, solve a number of problems, uh, potentially uh, including explainability a resilience to adversarial networks and, and, and provide uh, a means of avoiding the information loss that you see moving through a deep learning neural network as you get to, to the output. So, uh, so my money would be on Simon's work and probably a little bit of money on uh, Regis Professor Lee Cronin's computing work to grow next generation neuromorphic uh, devices up at University of Glasgow. Thank you. You've each got a million pounds, so you can each speak for um, at least 20 seconds more. <laughs> I mean, probably I'm biased because I'm a PhD and I like grants and stuff like that, but I would probably spend it on fundamental research and I would do it on multidisciplinary research, trying to bridge uh, classical social scientists with uh, machine learning engineers, because I think there's a huge risk here of uh, obscuring the whole discipline with these names of AI, neural networks, and stuff like that, and actually hiding all of these concerns on, on ethics and how and when should we intervene. I mean, I think the social and humani humanism uh, point of view should not be lost, so probably multidisciplinary teams. Thank you. So I would like to um, echo the statements here, both uh, explainability and uh, social research combining together, I think are the key f future factors. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, the research on spiking neural networks is really interesting, so I, I like that. But um, I, I, I think that, you know, because I did my master's in uh, security studies, and there was, you know, quantitative methods, but no machine learning and I think that AI has so much to contribute to um, operationalizing um, political science for policy. Uh, and so I'd, I'd really like research on, on that. Thank you. And with that, um, please ask you to join me in thanking the, my panels.